Good afternoon, and welcome to the United States Air Force Academy's 28th Annual National Character and Leadership Symposium. I'm Cadet First Class Michael Greisman, the cadet in charge of this year's NCLS, and URMC for this afternoon's Cadet Wing kickoff. Our Academy prides itself in creating warrior leaders of character. It accomplishes this through BCT, intercollegiate and club activities, training sessions, everyday cadet life, and opportunities just like this to learn, reflect, and listen from speakers all around the world. This year's National Character and Leadership Symposium will focus on warrior ethos as airmen and citizens. American heroes will tell you stories about courage, resilience, and preparing yourself for the worst possible day of your life. A journey of perseverance from a survivor of poverty and terrorism, learning to live with one leg up in life, and countless other stories of grit, determination, and tips for keeping ourselves mentally and physically prepared, ready to conquer anything. Yeah, this year is different. I don't think it's been said enough, and it's probably been said a million times. You're sitting in your room right now, probably pretty bummed out that you're not in Arnold Hall getting to see General Brown speak in person. But we, as cadets, still get a day off school to listen, reflect, and learn, and discuss the wisdom gained from those speakers around the world. You aren't crammed in D1 right now. You could sit back in your chair in your room, drink a coffee, relax, and listen to every single word that you hear. Whether you're a four dig, three dig, two dig, or a firsty, we all have room to grow as leaders. Use these next two days to your advantage. Learn from the speakers, reflect, ask questions, truly take it in and take one step forward to become that leader that you came here to be. I'm now honored to introduce our speaker for this kickoff event, the 22nd Air Force Chief of Staff, General Charles Q. Brown Jr. General Brown was commissioned in 1984 as a distinguished graduate from Texas Tech University. General Brown is a command pilot with more than 2,900 flying hours, including 130 combat. He has commanded a fighter squadron, the U.S. Weapons School, two fighter wings, and the U.S. Air Force Central Command. Prior to serving as Air Force Chief of Staff, General Brown was the commander of Pacific Air Force. We truly are honored to have him kick off this 28th Annual National Character and Leadership Symposium. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the Chief of Staff of the United States Air Force to the first ever virtual NCLS, General Charles Q. Brown, Jr. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Let, let, let me start off with a quote from Winston Churchill. Success is not final. Failure is not fatal. It is the courage to continue that counts. I will just tell you failure is part of life. And if you don't fail, you're, you're not learning. Uh, I failed many times throughout my career. As a matter of fact, that's uh, probably why I'm successful because I fell so many times. I've learned to grow and it's really not the fact that you fail, it's how you respond to that failure. And that's one of the things I wanna talk about today. So first of all, thanks to uh, Cadet Griezmann. I appreciate the, uh, the introduction to the good friend, Lieutenant General Clark and to the entire Air Force Academy. Uh, thanks for allowing me to kick off this National Character Leadership Symposium. It's great to be with you this afternoon. Uh, I'd much rather be there in person to uh, spend time with you, but I look forward to the opportunity to do that in, in the future. I would say as you, as you look at this particular conference and, and this particular symposium is that you truly take advantage of the, uh, what many of the uh, speakers are gonna have, use that to get involved. And I will tell you that there's gonna be something that'll be said over the course of the next couple of days about leadership that you'll be able to use. Uh, I wanna take some, go through at least a, a small portion here and then leave some time for, for questions. And so let me share what I would say, uh, my five points of advice to you uh, as a leader. One, fail to succeed. Two, challenge the status quo. Three, trust but verify. Four, have attitude. And five, define success. So let me go to the first point, fail to succeed. You should never play for second place. You need to always put your best foot forward. And that's the way I do personally. Now I also realize that I'm not always, always win all the time. That sometimes I'm gonna end up in second place or even worse, but it will not be due to lack of trying. Uh, and I will fail. And let, let me share with you a very uh, good story. So when I was a first lieutenant, I'd uh, finished up my F-16 training at McDill, went to Kunsan for my first operational assignment, 
And uh, as part of that assignment, you go through your mission qualification training, and then you get your first initial tactical check ride as a fighter pilot. Uh, I took that check ride and I failed. Um, and then, uh, you know, of course, I have to go back and get ready to take the recheck. And so when I did the recheck, uh, I passed, but I got additional training. So it was actually kind of passing, but with a little failing mark, would require some additional training. And I will tell you, that actually drove me throughout the rest of my career. Uh, because I've always been very competitive, uh, but that was a mark on my record, but it was it's really the foundation of what got to where I, I am today. And so from that time, and there's a quote from Martin Luther King Jr. that I've actually uh, taken the liberty to adapt a little bit to make it uh, more leadership focused. And it says, the ultimate measure of a leader is not where one stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where one stands in times of challenge and controversy. For me personally, uh, as a brand new lieutenant, that was a time of challenge and controversy. I'll also tell you, it's really how you respond in those type of scenarios will allow you to, whether that's a complete failure, you continue to fail, or you fail to succeed and learn from that mistake or that challenge or that failure to propel yourself forward. The second uh, point is challenge the status quo. Uh, for those that have studied Latin, and at least that's what some people have told me, it, it says uh, status quo means the mess we're in. And too often what I find uh, across our Air Force is we get into a, a methodology of that's the way we've always done it. I really believe you should challenge the status quo. And you can't always wait for higher levels of leadership to give you guidance. You should ask questions of why. Um, why, if you've seen the letter to Airmen that I've sent out here recently, and if not, well, get make sure uh, General Clark and some of the uh, cadre there gets that to you. Which you should ask why. And your leadership state should say why not and allow you to go move forward. You know, I had a uh, when I was the air component commander for CENTCOM during the defeat ISIS campaign, I had a uh, British officer who worked for me. And the term he used was instead of asking for permission, he said, proceed until apprehended. And sometimes I think you got to do that. You just got to move out because you know what's, what's the right thing to do. And uh, at some point, someone will apprehend you and bring you back and put you in the right direction. But it's that kind of initiative sometimes that will help you challenge the status quo. The other part of challenging status quo is too often it is so easy to say no. And if it's something you really believe in, I really you should actually be persistent and consistent in your message. And what I get through, if you, you know, the, um, the five stages of grief, I talk about the five stages of no. You'll get hell no, no, we'll think about it, not a bad idea, we should have been doing that already. Sometimes you have to work through all five stages of no to get to yes. And if it's that important to you, uh, keep pushing. Third point is trust but verify. I think you need to be inquisitive and not rely on the first answer you receive. Uh, you trust, but you also verify by asking others. And it's not just asking those close to you. Ask as many people as you can. Uh, I'll just tell you, when I shop on Amazon, uh, I, I actually look at a lot of the reviews. That's me, not trust but verify, to ask a lot of different questions before I actually commit. I'll, I'll give you another story. So after, I, and this goes back even further to, uh, now as a second lieutenant, I'm at my F-16 training at McDill, and um, the way the system worked back then was we had 12 students in our class, and it would give us 12 locations we could go to, and uh, if we could all agree, then that's the assignments we would get, and we'd move out. And so in my class, we had uh, three of us that wanted to go to Kunsan for our first assignment, but only two Kunsan slots and one slot to Homestead. Homestead was my second choice. And so my classmates told me, hey, CQ, why don't you just go ahead and take your second choice? We'll just be done with it. And I said, I don't want to do that. Um, I, not that I don't trust you, but, uh, you know, I think there's a way to actually do this. And so what we did is we sent in our, our uh, for uh, assignment uh, desires for each of the 12 of us. And, uh, and so what happened is nobody went to Homestead. All three of us went to Kunsan. And I will tell you again, that set the stage for the rest of my career to allow me to uh, well, first, go fell my first check ride, uh, but two, <laughs> set the stage for me to get a chance to go to weapon school, uh, to be a weapon school instructor, to be a commandant of the weapon school. And I say eventually probably the chief of staff of the Air Force. And so um, I always believe that to, you need to lay out your goals. Think about your short term, your midterm and your long term goals. And I always believe also that you should always ask for what you want. Because the worst the Air Force can do is tell you no. But if you don't ask, the answer is automatically no. 
And that story I just shared with you, if I, if I had not asked, I would have ended up at Homestead. Not that Homestead's a bad location, because that was my second assignment, operational assignment. I spent four years at Homestead and loved it. But that's not where I wanted to go first. And because I asked, the Air Force said yes. And I encourage you to do that. The next is they have attitude. Uh, you can't succeed on talent alone. Uh, you need to have attitude. What I mean by attitude is you need to be confident. Yet maybe, and sometimes even maybe a little bit cocky about your confidence, uh, but not too cocky. The point of the matter is, um, as a leader, and I've, as long as I've done this, it's very easy. I can tell those that have confidence when they walk in the room, when they come to talk to me, when they come to brief me, when they come to sit down across the table from me, um, you can tell those that have attitude and have a level of confidence. I also think it's the aspect of confidence is you also need to be confident when you don't know. You need to be able to sit, confidently say, I do not know. Because I can also see when you're blowing smoke. And uh, from that level of confidence, that level of attitude is important. But I also think you need to be uh, humble, approachable, and credible. And that was the, uh, the mantra when I was there as a weapon school, uh, as a weapon school commandant. It started by a couple of comments uh, ahead of me. And matter of fact, we had a conversation about who came up with it first. And uh, everybody was so humble, no one would take credit for it. Uh, but I think it became the culture of the, the Air Force Weapons School to be humble, approachable, and credible. Uh, that aspect to me is important, not only having an attitude, but also understanding that you are good at what you do, all of you. The fact that all of you are sitting at the Air Force Academy right now tells you something about yourself and your peers you graduated from high school with. That you, you came into a very rigorous program, and those that are uh, uh, first degrees that are getting close to graduation, uh, you've actually made it through the gauntlet and are almost there. Uh, but I'll tell you, there's much more to do when you get out and get commissioned and become part of our United States Air Force. But it's the whole aspect of, of, of when you look at being humble, approachable, and credible, the fact that uh, having that attitude and understanding that, you know, when I went to weapons school, I, I did okay. Uh, I busted five rides. I know exactly rides I busted and the instructors that busted me and what I busted for. It was that much of a significant emotional event. I was actually fairly surprised that I got called uh, several months later to come back as a weapons school instructor. I don't know that it was because of my talent. Um, I think I'm a, a decent fighter pilot or a decent pilot at large. But I think mostly it's because of my attitude. By having a positive attitude and approaching each one of the problems, uh, each challenge I had as an opportunity. The, uh, the last uh, uh, point of advice for you is, is to define success. Um, for each one of you, uh, you need to define success, both in long-term, but also in short-term. And for success for some of you, maybe getting a Friday each week, maybe getting to the end of the semester, it may be getting to graduation, it may be, you know, whatever career field you want to be in part of our United States Air Force. It may be that you want to do a full career in the Air Force. You only want to do four years. You got to define that for yourself. The one thing I would ask you to consider is never take short-term happiness at the expense of your long-term goals. Because you can take some short-term happiness and forget, you know, you just put yourself in a square corner. You can't reach that long-term goal you have. Um, and in some cases, you, get, you got to take a little bit of short-term sadness to get to your long-term goal. And so I encourage you to, to uh, think about that as you're going forward. So as we get ready to uh, take questions, what I'd ask you to do is don't be afraid to fail. Uh, we've all failed. Those that have been successful have failed. Uh, I, as I say, I'm a 36 year overnight sensation. Um, yeah, I'm here after 36 years, but there's a, lot of, there's a lot of runway behind me. A lot of things I've learned that I've been uh, successful at, but there's certain things I've failed at. And uh, I will tell you, I am still learning as a leader. Um, I actually still listen to podcasts on leadership. I, I read about leadership. Um, I, I live and breathe leadership. And so let me stop there and I'm looking forward to your questions. General Brown, thank you. Thank you for that that awesome kickoff to, to NCLS. Um, failure to succeed. I, I know I speak for the entire cadet wing and, and personally that here at the academy, we, we fail and we fail a lot. And sometimes that failure, it, it beats you up. And so, so I appreciate that failure to succeed. Um, so moving into our first question that we've received from the, the cadets, this theme around warrior ethos this year um, and mindset and really just maintaining that positivity through failure, um, like you said, how do you continue to proceed whenever you do receive that pushback? Um, when you were a lieutenant or a young officer, when you received that pushback, when you were trying to to make a change, how did you still proceed with that positive attitude that you carry today with that, that warrior ethos in mind? Well, part, part of it is, is kind of the conversation with uh, my peers, but also with my leaders and, and building a relationship. 
and that's what helps you to, to actually, um, I would say, get some of the buy-in when you're trying to get some things done as a warrior and having that ethos. And even at this level, even at the lower level, it's all about relationships. If you don't have the right relationship, it's hard for people sometimes to say yes because it, it, it's, a, it's a bond of trust that happens between different levels of leadership. And, and to me, that's the, one of the most important things you can do is, is build a relationship so you're not, you know, when you have an issue, you're trying to make a change. It's not like a cold call in a crisis. It's something where you've already built that relationship. So when you do call, the folks above you are more inclined. How can I help? And, and I think that's that's the aspect. And, and then the other, and this goes back to what I, the story I shared with you about my, me coming back as a weapons school instructor. Um, when those above you see that you've got a positive attitude, you're trying to do the right thing, uh, they're more inclined to, to, to watch and pull you into positions and help you. And um, uh, another quick story, I, you know, I was the aide to, the, the aide to General Fogel when he was the chief of staff. I did not put in a package. I didn't apply. Uh, matter of fact, when I got a phone call, told me I was being considered. I, I asked the question, you know, what does an aide do? Because I was, I, honestly, I was clueless. And um, that was because someone had, was watching me and, and it seen how I, I've carried myself as a warrior and, and how I responded to some of the challenges. And because of that, they nominated me unbeknownst to me. And uh, I think that was part of the reason why I'm sitting here today. Uh, I learned a lot. Uh, from that, from that experience, it helped propel me to where I am today. Thank you, sir. Um, that's actually a perfect segue into our next question coming from Detachment 560 or 560. Um, learning from others and your own failure, who, who's been that, that greatest mentor for you that helped you get through that? Because um, we know how important mentors are. Well, you know, I've had a lot of mentors, but, you know, the one I would, uh, Party started as my dad. You know, my dad served 30 years in the army. Um, the whole reason I'm doing this is because this is this is his idea. Uh, ROTC, four years, and uh, four years will not hurt you in the military. Um, he actually encouraged me to apply to the academies, and I was not that interested in the military. Uh, and so I went to ROTC um, and because he had taught ROTC. But early in my career, I spent a lot of time talking to him uh, on how best to do things, and. Uh, and then I, I had some, some key flight commanders, um, Mark Tapper, Bill Minger, um, weapons officer Todd Denning, folks that really, you know, um, that really stood out to me, that helped me early in my career. And then really my, I would say my roommates I had when I was a lieutenant at Kunsan. Uh, we, we, lived in the, we lived in the party hooch, and, uh, but we were also strong lieutenants, uh, Chuck Weddle and Miles Lansing, who are still good friends of mine. And it's that network of people. And so it's, it's not just one mentor. It's a lot of folks that I've been engaged with. And, and that's what I encourage all of you is don't have just one mentor. Uh, you, you do what I would call a lot of comparison shopping uh, to be able to talk to a number of mentors that will help develop your career. And then you'll have folks that will help you that didn't, you know, uh, just because they see your, your drive and your attitude that will come out of the woodwork and, and help you um, be a stronger officer, being a stronger leader. Thank you for that, sir. Um, that's one thing we're trying to focus more here at the Academy is mentorship and, and pushing, pushing cadets more to, to seek that mentorship, to learn from the ones that have done it better than us. Um, the next question is, what was the biggest dilemma that you have faced and how did you use your, your personal warrior ethos to, to overcome it? Um, well, there's probably been several, but there's one that really stands out to me. Um, and, um, I was leading the, uh, when I was a uh, operation officer in the uh, F-16 squadron, I was leading the 10 ship back from Nellis back to Shaw. And uh, the weather on the way back from uh, getting back to Shaw was, was, was bad. And then we actually ended up uh, diverting into Charleston. And I was the first one to land. And uh, I ended up hydroplaning. And uh, because of the hydroplaning, I put my hook down to catch the, the cable and the, the cable wasn't hooked up all the way. And I spun and basically after that, I shut down the runway uh, other than my wing wing land right behind me. And we had eight other aircraft divert across the Southeast. And I felt like in that case, as a leader, I'd failed. Uh, I found my squadron mates because I, you know, I put them in, in, in a challenging situation. And so the way I handled it, as soon as we got back and got everybody back in the squadron, I went in front of the entire squadron and, and apologized and talked about to them about what was going through my mind when it happened. And uh, I think yeah, as a leader, um, that's how you build credibility. When you make a mistake, you need to be able to admit it and be able to admit it publicly. 
Uh, folks will respect you more as a leader when you have those types of dilemmas. And, uh, you know, I was still waiting to go to be a squadron commander as well. And so when you have situations like that, you know that certain things that you want to have for, helping for you in the future are in jeopardy. Um, I actually I go back even further. Let me give you another quick story. So uh, I was a captain at Homestead getting ready. I had applied to weapons. Well, I hadn't gone yet. And I uh, planned F-16 uh, over the Everglades, struck by lightning, caught on fire, and I ejected into the Everglades and spent about 15 minutes out there before I got picked up by a Coast Guard helicopter. And so after that happened, I got back on the ground now, and I'm wondering about my weapons school. Was I going to get the chance to go? Well, about uh, probably about three weeks later, I got the, you know, the nod that I was going to weapons school. And so it's things like that where you, you have uh, a very challenging situation and you, you, you worry about the things that are going to happen in the future. Uh, what I encourage you is not so much worry about how you handle that situation when it does happen. This is the most important thing you can do and how you bounce back from that. Uh, just like I talked about the Martin Luther King Jr. quote will help you propel yourself past whatever the lumber or whatever failure or whatever challenge that, uh, that came your way. Yes, sir. So moving back to those, that captain year, that second lieutenant year, what, what's one piece of advice you would give yourself or you, you wish you knew? Hmm. I probably would ask more questions. Um, you know, one of the, and this is something I, I would share all, with all the cadets. And, and when I uh, mentor, and as you look to, to those that are more senior to you, what, what a number of folks will tell me, hey, um, I didn't call you because you were too busy. I didn't see an email because I thought you were going to be too busy. Well, let me determine how busy I am. You know, if you send it to me, um, you, you may not get a response or you may not, I might be able to respond back to you right away. But one of the most important things a leader can do is, is develop the leaders that come behind them. And, and so that mentorship is, is so important. And, and sometimes you're not going to have a mentor just, just fall into your lap or just come to you and go, hey, I want to be your mentor. What you've got to do is seek out as a mentee who your mentors are going to be. And, uh, you know, I probably didn't do that enough. And I, I, I'll tell you, even as a, as a junior general officer, as a one star, I probably didn't do that enough to ask a few extra questions. You just kind of, you know, as a good friend of mine said that, uh, you know, I just figured the system will take care of me. Well, the system will take care of you, but it may not be the way you want it to take care of you. And so sometimes you got to ask a few more questions. Thank you for that answer, sir. Uh, I mean, I completely understand. It's hard. Sometimes it's hard to find mentors, to talk to people, going up and, and reaching out to your teachers. It, it's it's difficult. Um, and, and I know all the cadets that are watching this ROTC academies, we all understand that. Um, the next question comes from Detachment 160 out of the University of Georgia. <clears throat> um, sir, many cadets have a strong sense of who they are as they grow as leaders. What advice do you have for bridging the gap for new cadets who do not yet see who they can be as officers and leaders? Well, I, I, a part of this is self-assessment. There, there's two parts, self-assessment and, and, and to challenge yourself. Um, with the self-assessment, I, I really believe is, I, and I talk in some of my leadership, uh, other leadership uh, discussions is, know what your superpower is. If you understand your superpower, the only way you figure that out is actually being able to go out and test your superpower. You know, if you, you can't leave off over a tall building until you try it. You don't know that. Okay. So you got to do some things in order to figure out where your superpowers lie. At the same time, you're going to fail in certain areas. And after a while you keep falling in the same area, you go, well, that's probably not my superpower. And, uh, cause you can't bounce back, bounce back for that. And, and so that's the part I would, I would encourage, uh, our more junior folks to do, and then really observe other leaders. So it's observing other leaders, picking up the things that they do that you like and some things that you don't like. Uh, at the same time, you know, I, I do, I spend a lot of time reading books on leadership, listening to podcasts on leadership. I pick up little tips here and there that I put into my toolkit as a leader. And, and that's the, the part that uh, I think is important as, a, as, a, as you're building yourself as a leader is to test yourself uh, by putting yourself in. If you, if, if you don't put, if you put yourself in, in all these easy situations, you never get tested as a leader. Uh, the more you put yourself in challenging situations or don't shy away from challenging situations, that's going to develop you as a leader. Um, because you're going to fail in some of those. And when you do fail, you'll learn a little bit about yourself, your leadership style, uh, but you also need to fight for feedback too. Um, fight for feedback from your, your superiors, your peers, and your subordinates that you have the privilege to lead. General Brown, I, I'd, I'd love to hear your superpower. Um, I think that my superpower is being able to take very complex uh, situations and break them down simply to be able to explain them. I like using analogies. 
I like using sports analogies to simplify things that I think are very complex. Um, I think I'm good at listening. So I, I, lo- I like to you know, like to sit in meetings and just take all the information in. And once I take the information in, I go, okay, here's what I, based on what everybody said, here's what I think I heard. Here's what I think we need to do. And, uh, and so that's, that's, that, that's me. It helps that I'm an introvert. So I'm, I'm not, not talking, I'm listening a little, a little bit more sometimes. Um, but I think that's the, the, what I would call my superpower. And, but I'm not afraid to take a, take a risk too. Um, as I said, I've, I've far exceeded every place I ever planned to be, and I'm not afraid to fail. And, and that's the, maybe I wouldn't call it a superpower, but that's a, an extra trait I have that I'm not afraid of failure. Thank you, sir. Um, well, we'll run into our last question so, so all the cadets can get to class. Um, I think it'd be an awesome way to finish it out with what tools should we focus on right now as cadets to, to use these 92 days for us first season, however many for everyone else? Um, what should we focus on to, to be the best future leaders we could possibly be? I would say soak in as much information you can. I mean, you're, you're, you're on the final stretch now and you, you've had three and a half years uh, plus to, to soak that in. Not, not just the three and a half years at the academy. Just think about your time in high school, your, your time in middle school, your time in you know elementary school and, you know, the sports you played, the clubs you participated in. All those things now come to crescendo that now you're, you're, you're going to come and, and be part of our United States Air Force or, or part of the Space Force. And I think the, 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 in these last 90 something days that you, you have is take some time to reflect, take, take some time to think, kind of assess yourself about your superpower. But then as you walk into whatever it is as a new lieutenant, that understand that the, the superpower you have may not be the, you know, the superpower you actually see once you get into whatever career flow you're going to. You need to learn about yourself and be ready to, to, to adjust as you go. And uh, the last thing I offer to you as you, as you, uh, as you go forward is, um, Start thinking about what your short-term, mid-term, and long-term goals are. Because you'll have an opportunity. Once you go through your initial training, come into your career field, at some point, someone's going to ask you, hey, what do you want to do next? You need to be thinking about that. Um, I, I would encourage you to, to think through that process. What I, what I encourage lieutenants to do and captains, if you want to travel, this is the time to do it early in your career. Go see and do. And then at some point, it's less about the location. It becomes more about the job to develop you as a leader, particularly as you get to a little bit more senior. Um, Last thing I would say is enjoy the last, your last days at the academy. Um, the, uh, the, you know, I'm sure it's been exciting and fun, but challenging as well. Uh, you've made some friends and uh, make sure you, you stay in contact with those friends that you had a chance. I, you know, I stay in friends, contact with my friends from college, as well as my uh, lieutenant buddies from uh, Kunsan, and uh, they become lifelong friends. Thank you so much, General Brown. I think one of the big things I'm personally going to take away is, is the time you had at Kunsan and, and really sticking to that. Yeah, work hard, but play harder. Um, so, sir, I, I really appreciate uh, you kicking us off for this NCLS. And, and I hope everyone that got to watch gets, takes a little piece away of what you said. Um, thank you so much. As a token of our appreciation, a commemorative plaque is on its way to you. We really, we, we hope you, you remember this time with us and maybe one day you'll get out here in person and we'll get to see you. Um, for everyone else, this concludes the NCLS session. We hope you enjoy the 28th Annual National Character and Leadership Symposium. Please take advantage of every opportunity you are given to, to see these amazing speakers. And that one thing you might take away might be the greatest thing you ever take away. Thank you. Enjoy NCLS. <laughs>